This Filmmaker IQ course is proudly sponsored by Northeast Community College, whose media arts program offers degree concentrations in audio recording, broadcasting, and digital cinema. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com, and in this course, we are going to take a deep dive, go beyond the triangle, and establish a fundamental understanding of exposure and metering. Outside of promises of future recognition in lieu of payment from shifty producers, exposure is basically the amount of light per unit area reaching a photographic film or electronic imaging sensor. This light is then translated by the photographic medium into an image. If we have too little light for our photographic medium, the image is said to be underexposed and the image looks very dark. If we have too much light, then the image is overexposed and looks too bright. So just like Goldilocks, we want our exposure to be just right. For the sake of simplicity, let's just call this the optimum exposure in that it renders a middle gray object as middle gray in our final image. Here in our simplified shot scenario with three different shaded spheres, the optimum exposure should render the middle gray sphere as middle gray in the final rendering. Now, of course, for artistic reasons, you may or may not want middle gray to be in the middle. You may prefer it to be either over or under the optimum exposure. But for the remainder of this lecture, I will be using optimum exposure as our default when I say the word exposure. So what are the concepts that govern the exposure? Well, we are not the first nor the last ones to approach this topic. It's almost become like a pastime for filmmakers and photographers to make and watch videos on this very subject. No doubt many of you watching right now probably have a good understanding of exposure and are just tuning in to judge how I present the information. Now, a lot of people will talk about the exposure triangle. Heck. I've even made a graphic depicting the triangle myself. But I've always felt like something was missing from that model. Instead, I want to present to you a different way of thinking about exposure. Remember, all photography, and by extension, all motion picture, is really the record of light as it passes through a lens. So let's think about exposure as the path that light has to take. This path begins from the scene luminance through lens modification, the exposure as governed by aperture and shutter speed, and then finally onto a recording medium whose sensitivity to light we can control. Let's start at the very beginning, which happens to be a very good place to start. Now, without light, there can be no exposure. So to start at the beginning means we start with the light source. Now we are going to get into some pretty heavy terminology here. You don't need to memorize the exact figures, but know that everything from here on out is dependent on the lights in our scene. Now there are three terms we are interested in. The intensity, the illuminance, and the luminance. Let's begin with the intensity. The luminous intensity over a given solid angle is measured in something called candelas, from the Latin word for candle, which is exactly how this was originally measured. A typical candle will have a luminous intensity of one candela. But unlike radiant intensity, which is all radiant energy from a source, which is measured in watts per steradian, the candela is a special SI unit which is weighted toward the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can actually see. A more precise definition, a candela is the luminous intensity in a given direction of a source that emits monochromatic radiation of frequency 540 times 10 to the 12 hertz, and that has a radiant intensity in that direction of 1 683rd watt per steradian. You don't need to memorize that. In fact, I didn't. <laughs> the point is, so while this candle is giving off infrared heat as well as visible light, the candela is only measuring the visual light it emits in a direction. 
Candelas, as we'll see in a moment, refer to how intensely bright something is. The light that flows from a light source is called the luminous flux or illuminance. The total amount of luminous flux from a source in all directions is measured in lumens. One lumen is the amount of light emitted per second in a steradian from a light source of one candela. A steradian being an SI unit of solid angle. Basically, it's the area of the surface of a sphere which has a surface area equal to the radius squared. Now there are four pi steradians in the surface of a sphere. So a candle with a brightness of one candela is emitting four pi lumens or roughly 12 lumens. Now if we obscure half of the candle with a non-reflective surface, the candle is only given off six lumens, even though it still has a luminous intensity of one candela. A lumens is something you will come across when looking at lighting fixtures. They tell you how much total light is produced by that fixture. And you often see this when purchasing both consumer and professional lighting products. Now we come to the unit we will use to measure how much light actually flows through or lands on a given area in space, the lux. One lux is one lumen per square meter which also happens to be the flow generated by one candela light at the distance of one meter. This is because of the definition of a steradian. The imperial version is the foot candle, which is one lumen per square foot, which is also the amount of light of one candela at one foot. Now there are 10.76 foot candles in one lux. So a quick approximation between foot candles and lux can be made by just multiplying or dividing by 10. How much lux we have is not only governed by how many lumens is being put out by the light source, but also how far away the light source is. This is governed by the inverse square law that states that light intensity will fall off by the inverse of the square of the distance. In other words, if we double the distance, we reduce the illuminance down to one quarter triple the distance and we reduce the illuminance down to one ninth. One small caveat though, this law is only for isotropic radiating sources. That is light emitted from a point in space, like this candle. When using lenses that alter the direction of the light rays, the inverse square law still stays in effect. It's just that the effective point of origin moves further back but this is a small caveat that doesn't really manifest itself in a noticeable way in practical application. I just bring it up as sometimes the math won't precisely work out unless you take this fact into consideration. But rarely are we photographing a light source. Let's talk about luminance, sometimes called brightness. Luminance refers to the light that is reflected off an object in the scene and is measured in candelas per square meter using SI units. The imperial unit is foot lamperts, which is one divided by pi candelas per square foot, which is equivalent to 3.426 candelas per square meter. As you can imagine, there are a lot of factors that govern how light bounces off an object, from the intensity and distance of the light to the viewing angle, the material reflectivity and absorption of the material, there's a lot of different factors at play. In the world of luminance displays like monitors and televisions, you'll sometimes hear the non-standard unit nit, which is equal to one candela per square meter. I'm sure we'll get back to all of these units in a course on lighting, but I do want to introduce these terms because you will see them over and over again as you begin to work with exposures and metering. So let's just recap briefly. The intensity of a light, the visible radiant energy is measured in candelas. One candle traditionally is one candela. The luminous flux generated by this light is measured in lumens, which is the flux from one candela per steradian. In terms of illuminance, the amount of light flowing through a given area is measured in lux, which is one lumen per square meter, or foot candles, which is one lumen per square foot. The brightness of light as it bounces off an object or in a scene 
or luminance is measured in candelas per square meter, or foot lamperts, which are one divided by pi candelas per square foot, or 3.426 candelas per square meter. Got all that? I know it's a lot, but we'll see them pop up again and again as we get into metering, so you might as well be familiar with them now. This part of the pathway of light, the scene illumination and luminance, is the only part of the exposure process where we can actually actively add light. As such, this part is crucial for determining the exposure. From here on out, we are essentially budgeting or cutting down how much light will eventually make it onto our sensor. There are essentially two kinds of lens modifications that can alter our exposure. And although their exact placement can be either in front of or behind the lens itself, I decided to place it second for the purposes of our discussion. The first possible obstacle in the pathway of light are filters, particularly ND filters or neutral density filters. The function of ND filters is to reduce the amount of light entering the exposure equation which we'll get to in a second. Think of ND filters as sunglasses for your camera. ND filters are rated for how much light they cut in powers of two, called stops. This is a term you will hear over and over again in this video. One stop of light loss means that only half of the original light will make it through. Two stops means only a quarter, and three stops mean one eighth of the light. Sometimes this is written as a number using the optical density equation, which I won't get into here. Basically 0.3 is one stop, and each 0.3 is one stop more. If you see a 1.2 ND filter, that means it's cutting light by four stops. That's 1 16th of the original light. The other kind of lens modification that can affect exposure are teleconverters and telecompressors. A teleconverter takes the incoming image and blows it up. The effect is increasing the focal length of the lens, but it also reduces the amount of light because we're basically throwing away the edge of the image as we zoom in. For example, this two times lens extender doubles the effective focal length of the lens, but reduces the exposure by two stops, meaning only a quarter of the light will get to the sensor. The opposite of a teleconverter is the telecompressor, like the popular Metabones Speed Booster. Instead of blowing up the image, it compresses down the size of the image circle laid down by the lens to fit a smaller sensor than what the lens was designed for. Because less light is wasted on non-exposing elements of the camera, the effect is an increase of exposure. Though light is not being added, it is only being more concentrated on the sensor itself. For example, this 0.71 speed booster reduces the focal length by a factor of one divided by the square root of two, which results in a gain of one stop of light. Though the calculations we make further down in this course do not generally consider these lens modification factors, you have to keep them in mind when you are trying to determine your exposure. Now let's talk about the actual act of exposure. Exposure has two parts, how much light we let in from the scene and how long do we let that light in for. How much light we let in is governed by the aperture. The aperture is described by the f-stop. Now we covered this a little more in our extens extensively in our properties of lenses video, but let's remind ourselves that the f-stop is equal to the focal length divided by the diameter of the entrance pupil or effective aperture as measured from the front of the lens. So the lower the f-stop on the lens, the bigger the entrance pupil is, the more of the available light we are letting in to our camera. Now, how much time we let light in for is governed by our shutter speed. Shutter speed in photography is described in fractions of a second or even seconds or minutes for really long exposures. In motion picture cameras, sometimes they are described as degrees. A shutter on a motion picture film camera is circular. The degrees represents how much of the shutter is left open to expose the film. 
When using degrees for the shutter speed, we must consider the frame rate to determine the shutter speed in fractions of a second. If our frame rate is 24 frames per second, a 180 degree shutter will give us an effective 1 48th of a second shutter speed. If our frame rate is 30 frames a second, that same 180 degree shutter will have an effective shutter speed of 1 60th of a second. I know some of you are chomping at the bit just waiting for me to demonstrate what different apertures and different shutter speeds look like. Well, hold on, because there's one concept that I want to discuss which will tie these two things together. The exposure value system, or EVS. The EVS concept was developed by the German shutter manufacturer Frederick Deichel in the 1950s. The idea was to replace two numbers, the f-stop and the shutter speed, with just one number, the EV. The math looks a little intimidating, but it really is quite simple once you examine it. EV equals log two of the f-stop squared divided by the exposure time in seconds. Let's work this out. The log two just means that each step of one on the EV scale doubles the amount of light. So an EV of 10 is double the amount of EV9. Each one EV, therefore, is one stop. Now, going into the equation itself, the reason why the aperture is squared is because if we want to add or subtract a stop of light using the aperture, we have to multiply or divide by the square root of two. By squaring the f-stop value, each stop is now a multiple of two, which gives us even steps once we take the log base two of the number. Here is a common EV chart. Let's pick EV12. Along the side, we see a list of possible f-stop values. If we want an exposure value of EV12, shooting at f1.4 shows us that we need a 1 2,000th a second exposure. Shooting at 2.8, we would need a 1 500th of a second. Shooting at f4, we would need 1 250th of a second. And going all the way to f11, we would need a 1 30th of a second exposure. Regardless of what combination of shutter speed and aperture we use, so long as we are at EV12, the exposure is identical. And here's the real world proof with this lighting model demonstration. The image on the left is shot at f11 with a shutter speed of 1 30th of a second. The image on the right is shot at f1.4 at 1 2000th of a second. Same exact exposure, but different effects. With the wider aperture on the right, we have a shallower depth of field, evident in the bloom of the stars in the background. But the higher shutter speed freezes the motion on the spinning checkered wheel, which is only a blur in the image on the left. We can even animate the transition between these two extremes. Here, each frame of this transition is a move of one third stop in shutter speed, while moving in the opposite direction with the aperture. The exposure does not change. This direct relationship between the shutter speed and the aperture as part of the exposure is called reciprocity. One stop gain in shutter speed is exactly the same in terms of exposure as one stop gain in aperture. But as you can clearly see, the effect of changing one or the other has very different visual consequences. So at this stage of the light path, we have determined how much light is actually in our camera. Now the last bit is the sensitivity of the recording medium itself. And now we get to the final stage of the pathway of light, where it is finally recorded on a medium. Historically, there have been lots of different systems for determining how sensitive a recording medium is, as how much or how little light is needed to create an exposure. I'm only gonna focus on the most modern one, the ISO standard, which has been in place since 1974. Determining the speed of a piece of film is pretty complicated and would probably take up a full course video just trying to explain. The most important thing to remember is that unlike f-stop or EV, which are logarithmic scales, the ISO is an arithmetic scale. And in order to double the sensitivity of the film, you need to double the ISO number. So ISO 200 is twice as sensitive to light or one stop more sensitive to light than ISO 100. 
ISO 400 would be twice as sensitive as 200, ISO 800 would be one more stop sensitive than 400, and so on. In the celluloid film world, this sensitivity to light had to do with the size of the silver halide grains in the emulsion. The bigger the grains, the less light needed to make an exposure. The downside of this is the image was grainier. The finer the grain, the more light was, the more light was needed to make an image, but the advantage was very clean images. When we talk about exposure for digital, there is a similar effect but the cause is significantly different. When a digital camera makes an exposure, each individual pixel on a camera sensor responds with a voltage. We go through the process of how digital sensors work much deeper in this previous video. But voltage generated by the exposure is very, very small. We need to amplify the voltage before we can send it to an analog to digital converter. The amount of amplification is what the ISO on a digital camera controls. Now imagine the volume knob on your favorite stereo. The more you turn up the volume, the louder the music, but also the louder the background noise. Raising the ISO not only raises the signal from the exposure, it raises the noise floor as well, which is why higher ISO images have more noise. Although shooting camera raw formats does give you back some control over the ISO, the amplification occurs before the electric signal from the sensor is sent out to the analog to digital converter and recorded as raw. Now the details may differ from camera to camera, but you still need to get the ISO in the correct neighborhood even if you are shooting raw. There are some strategies for ISO use when working with raw and log files, which we'll get into in a future course on dynamic range. Now, a couple caveats worth mentioning before we leave this section on ISO. The ISO standard organization gives cameras manufacturers a choice of five different techniques for determining the ISO settings on their digital cameras so that they would match the ISO performance of film. This does occasionally lead to some mismatch of ISO rating on the camera to what the actual ISO performance of the sensor itself but that's a rabbit hole for another time. We just breezed through all the elements of the pathway of light for exposure. Now let's put it all back together again. First, let's talk about determining the exposure from a luminance perspective. That is from the camera's perspective, taking in the light that is coming from the scene. This is known as spot metering. Here is the exposure equation. N squared divided by T equals L times S divided by K, where N is the f-stop, T is the shutter speed, L is the average scene luminance in candelas per meter squared, S is the ISO value, and K is the meter calibration constant. Canon, Nikon, and Siconic use 12.5, but this value can range from 10.6 to 13.4. If you recognize the left side of the equation there, it's because we saw it earlier in our discussion on exposure value, EV. So this equation can be rewritten as EV equals log base two of L times S divided by K. Now, don't get hung up on the math because you never ever really do it yourself. Either your camera or your light meter does it for you. I'm just walking you through the math to show you what's happening inside these devices. So let's take out our light meter and put it in spot meter mode. This is a reflective light mode, which is how we determine luminance. The spot meter only determines the light coming from a small portion of the scene. This particular spot meter evaluates a five degree portion of the scene. I have the meter set to just give me the raw data of candelas per meter squared. In this scene, I'm aiming my spot meter at the two gray figures sitting on the film reel. When I take a reading, it reads 24 candelas per meter squared. Now this is going to be essentially an average of the five degrees around those two figurines, which will give me a pretty good sense of the average scene luminance. Now it's really a matter of plugging in different desired settings for the three remaining camera side variables. Let's say I know I want to shoot with ISO 1600. Plugging in the numbers, I see that I get an EV of 11.5. Now, maybe I know I want a shutter speed of 148, 
because I'm following the 180 degree shutter rule. So plugging in those numbers, I get that I need to be shooting around f8. But let's say I look at this image and think to myself, maybe I want a shallower depth of field and really let those background stars bloom. Let's say I want to go all the way down five stops to f1.4. Looking back at our pathway of light, there are four other factors we can adjust to bring back our exposure. First, we can decrease the amount of light in the scene, perhaps by using a dimmer or by putting filters on the light or by moving the light further away from the subject. But the problem with this is it changes our lighting ratio between the background stars and the foreground. And let's say I just want to keep the lighting the way it is, so I don't want to touch it. Now I could change the shutter speed down five stops, going down from 1 48th a second to 1 2,000th of a second, but that looks kind of funky, so let's leave it at 1 48th. Well, there are two other things we can change. This camera has built-in ND filters that are rated for two stops, four stops, and six stops. Let's engage the four stop ND filter. Now we're getting warmer. We just have to go one additional stop. So what's left is the ISO. I can go from ISO 1600 down an entire stop to ISO 800. And now the image is back to the same exposure, only this time with a much more shallower depth of field. When we perform a spot meter reading, we are looking at a particular part of the scene which we want to be exposed to middle gray. But what if we don't have anything in our scene to reference that has the same tonality as middle gray? Well, this is where you can turn to the zone system created by Ansel Adams and Fred Archer. Now we won't spend too much time talking about the zone system other than to give you a general gist of the idea. The zone system takes the full dynamic range from darkest to brightest and breaks them out into 10 zones. The middle zone, zone five, is where your middle gray sits. A move of one zone in either direction is a shift of one stop. Then Adams assigns different everyday photographic items to different zones. So the middle zone, zone five, would be where clear northern sky, dark skin, or average weathered wood ought to sit. So if you take a meter reading of those things, the value that your light meter gives you is the ideal setting you want to use. Now, one stop above, one step above zone six would include average Caucasian skin, light stone, or shadows on snow and sunlit landscapes. If you took a spot reading of one of those things, your meter would give you a setting that is one stop above the proper exposure. Since you know we're in zone six, you know you get to set your camera one stop lower to get the right exposure. The zone system goes pretty deep beyond what I've just described here. And each zone has a list of commonly found photographic elements that you can reference. There is some criticism of the zone system, but it is one practical way of determining your exposure. If you use a monitor with false color options, that's almost a modern version of the zone system. However, modern digital cameras offer a variety of other more precise methods of metering that include things like center weighted average metering or matrix metering that use the equation that we just outlined earlier. Now, basically, these things are determining the exposure settings by taking several different small spot readings on the sensor and then calculating the average scene illumination to be plugged into the equation. So far, we've been determining the exposure from the scene luminance. Now let's look at it from the illuminance side. That is judging the exposure based on the lights that are in the scene. For this, we turn our light meter into an incidence meter. Instead of candelas per square meter, we now measure in lux. When we take a reading, we are asking how many lux, that is how many lumens per square meter are passing through this point in space. The equation is just slightly different. We replace L with E for illuminance, and the reflected light meter constant K gets replaced with the incident light meter constant C, where C is between 240 and 400. A value of 250 is commonly used. And then the math works out pretty much the same way. The reciprocity rule stays in effect exactly the same way as it did with the spot metering exercise, and you don't have to do the math at all, because it's all done with you inside your light meter. 
So why would you use incidence metering over spot metering? Well, there are several advantages. When you take an incident reading, you are measuring how much light is falling on the subject, regardless of the reflectivity of the subject in question. If you took a spot reading of a black and white rabbit, my buddy Axel here, you'd get different readings for the black and white patches on his fur. But an incident reading would give you a more consistent answer because it measures how much light is actually falling on him. Spot meters can also be thrown off by colors. Here are three different colored spheres, each one with a slightly different spot reading, even though the lighting remains pretty much even on all three spheres. Furthermore, incident readings are useful for determining lighting ratios and judging the power of one light to another light. I will cover this concept in greater detail in a future video. But incident readings aren't always practical, especially if you can't get to the subject that you're trying to photograph in order to take an incident reading, say like El Capitan in this photo by Ansel Adams. In situations like that, you have to use a spot meter. Although today our digital cameras already have spot meters built right in. From candelas to EVs, I hope what we covered here has taken some of the mystery out of exposure and given you a more complete understanding of how light and metering works. Now, though we are using precise numbers, ultimately exposure is about producing art. You can overexpose or underexpose to your taste. The meter is just there to give you more information to base your creative decisions. From scene illumination, lens modification, exposure, and sensor sensitivity, each of these aspects of the pathway of light are crucial to creating the final image. Ultimately, it all boils down to one relatively simple equation. When we say photography is all about light, we aren't kidding. Light is all there is, whether you are carefully crafting it or snapping a selfie. This interplay of light that we've discussed is happening in every photograph and every frame of motion picture. Hopefully all of this will help you take the next step in your photographic and cinematic journey. All that's left to do is to go out there and expose something great. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Hit that little bell icon if you haven't already. And do us a favor and share this video with your friends. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook and consider becoming a patron on Patreon and help us bring you more content like this as well as access to our patron-only content. Link to the full course, written course on FilmmakerIQ.com in the description below. I'm John Hess and I'll see you right there at FilmmakerIQ.com.